Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> Hope you're doing all right today. Ah, not a whole lot going on. Some of the same announcements that we've had. We've got the dates for the stuff in the rest of the month in the bulletin for you to look at. And uh, otherwise, not a whole lot of the other announcements have really changed around since then. So um, we are doing divine service setting for today. And uh, today we are looking at the one thing needful. What does it mean in terms of uh, how did Christ love this young man? And how is tough love sometimes the appropriate thing for us as well? When we think that maybe we can get a little bit beyond ourselves as Christians. So uh, sometimes God loves us in what seems to be tough ways, or unusual ways, but it, it works out for our good. And so, uh, and we'll be kind of looking at that as the theme of worship today. So we are going to begin with the opening hymn, When Morning Gilds the Skies. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, 
and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with the man who deals generously and leads, who conducts his affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved, he will remember forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Play, praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. justice to wormwood 
and cast down righteousness to the earth. They hate him who reproves in the gate, and they abhor him who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor, and you exact taxes of grain from him, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions, and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe, and turn aside the needy in the gate, therefore he who is prudent will keep silent at such a time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you, as you have said. Hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from Hebrews chapter 3. Take care, brothers, lest there be any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God, but exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all of those who left Egypt, led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? But to those who were disobedient, so we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Please rise as we sing together the Alleluia in verse. Being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, 
who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. On the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and descended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who is spoken by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, in the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. In school, I don't know if it's still the case, but at least at one point in time, people were encouraged to do their best to study hard the idea being that if you study hard and you work hard, you will get ahead in the world, and that school is important for getting you there. And, you know, sometimes they would even throw out that line of, oh, the American dream, where, you know, if you work real hard and apply yourself, who knows, you could be a captain of industry or even a, a major political figure if you just sort of work hard enough. Now, of course, uh, if you do work hard, chances are you're, you're not going to simply rise to the top in the meritocracy of sorts because you will work hard and then you will realize that it's who you know, not what you know. And that depending upon who you can schmooze and uh, who wants favors from you and what have you, you have to, if you will, give a little mail in order to get a little mail. And, uh, you know, a little, white envelope, a little white envelope under the door goes a long way. And you realize that uh, you can be pretty darn incompetent and still go far if you learn how to play the game well. Uh, and I guess in some ways this is frustrating, but this is the way people are. And uh, you realize that when you study history, most of the people who have been leaders in society already had connections from their birth. And that uh, people who have become powerful had all the networks and everything going in their favor. There have been few people who have come from nowhere to become powerful and great. The only real time that that might have happened was in the late 19th and early 20th centuries because the United States was expanding so fast and so many new industries and other opportunities were opening up. But even smart people like Nikola Tesla found themselves really struggling at times. Whereas Thomas Edison, for example, he was a player and uh, he knew how to play the game from early on, as did other magnets of industry. And this relates to the idea of how we perceive ourselves as doing and how well we can do. You know, in English, there is this kind of, I guess you could call it an ambiguity. What does it mean when I say I can't do it? Does it mean I do not have the ability to do it? Or does it mean I have the ability to do it, but it's just not going to happen? Uh, and, and I was studying, for example, the small catechism yesterday, uh, looking up a couple of things, and what I found interesting is that in the Latin version of Luther's small catechism that was written shortly after his German version, that uh, the Latin is very clear when it talks about our faith. Uh, we usually say... Uh, that I, by reason of my own uh, intellect and strength, cannot come to believe uh, in my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ or call upon his name, but it's the Holy Spirit who 
calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies me, even as the Spirit calls, gathers, and enlightens the entire Christian church on earth. And uh, by strength of my intellect, you, you, what do you mean that I can't believe it's because I just don't really try hard enough? Or is it because there's no way of doing it? And the Latin leaves no ambiguity there. It uses this, this phrase, uh, nullo modo posse, in no way possible, in no way possible can my intellect and any strength in me, any power or mental faculty, in no way can that approach and gain faith in Jesus Christ without the work of the Holy Spirit to call, gather, enlighten, and sanctify me. And uh, so as a result, we realize with this language is that if anything is going to happen to us, whether it is in worship or in our personal lives to bring us closer to God, it's the Holy Spirit using the means of grace to get us there to have the proclamation of scripture and the uh, receiving of the sacraments be the things, the lifelines, that pull us in from the rough, sinful seas of this world to the safe haven of the Lord. And that's what we see with this rich young man. He is a successful person, but he's also an upright person, which you got to give them kudos for that. There are not a lot of successful people that don't cut corners. And yet, this rich young man said, Hey, I've been following the rules since I was little. I've been going to worship. I've been following the commandments. These all I have done. But what's interesting is he's got all these deeds, and he's got no faith. He comes to Jesus with the right words. Good teacher, he says. And he comes up hastily. And this is, of course, as Jesus is preparing to go to Jerusalem and, and uh, enter into his suffering so that he might save the world. And, and as this is all gearing up, this, this young, rich young man comes to Jesus and kneels down before him and says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And... Jesus doesn't send him away, he doesn't rebuff him, but he puts this question up there. Well, it's interesting that you call me good, because nobody is good except God alone. Now, here are the commandments. And you're saying, well, now, how is that kind of a response to this young man? Well, if you... <coughs> kind of know Eastern culture, a lot of times they will say something to you in a very subtle way in order to get what you really mean out of you without you realizing it. So what will happen, and, and you can even read this in modern literature concerning the, the Orient, uh, is they, they have ways of phrasing things so that if you're a smart cookie, you will pick on the subtleties. You'll, you'll pick up on what is Jesus really driving at here. And the clue, of course, is him saying, no one is good but God alone. Now, here are the commandments. Had the young man really, really been attentive at, and on point, he would have said, Ah, no one is good but God alone. I have confessed you as being the Son of God. You have already stated, and, and others, that you are the Son of God. So if he really knew Jesus, and he really knew what Jesus was about, he, he would have said something like, Lord, I am really bad at following the commandments, but this I know, that you are the Christ, the Son of God. And, and, uh, I am led by the Lord to call you good uh, because that is who you are. That would have been more the proper answer, but instead he got sidetracked by Jesus listing out the commandments and, oh yeah, the commandments, I know how to do those. And then notice that he goes from calling Jesus good teacher to just plain teacher. That suggests that the man backed off 
You know, if good means that Jesus is God, well, I can't call him that. Now, of course, the fact that Jesus is God had already been stated by Peter, and it was kind of out there. So it wasn't like it, was, it would have been a complete loss. But even then, even then, even though the man got sidetracked, Jesus still loved him, this man. And in his love for this man, he said, okay, give up everything you have. Sell it, give it to the poor, and follow me. And the man, what did he do? He, he shut down. He walked away. He couldn't give up his real love, his possessions. This whole time, Jesus had been trying to suss out who this man's real love is. Because it's easy to talk and move your mouth. It's difficult to make your actions follow what your words have said. And through Jesus' dialogue with this man, he was trying to uncover who this man really loved. What was really in this man's heart? What was really the focus, the center of this man's life? Was it the good teacher? Was it the Son of God? Was it at least the commandments and the word of the Lord? And after kind of peeling these all back, these layers... You really get to the thing, don't you? He loved his possessions. His possessions were the thing that clung to his heart, to his soul. They were on his mind. His stuff was his God. Of course, we Christians wind up being in bad places when our stuff becomes our God. And this became very much a thing back in the mid-20th century. After the Second World War especially, there were a number of high-profile authors in politics and in business who wanted to boil down human existence to kind of these psych-social motivations that were going on uh, and the idea of human organization as a function designed to produce an outcome as if somehow we were all widgets. And of course, out of this type of thinking arose the Harvard business model, which says that employees are bad. And so if we can automate processes, then we can save money, and you know, it doesn't matter if we boot somebody out of his job because it saves money. Too bad for them, right? And LCMS authors had written about you know, this isn't really the greatest way to live. We are more than just economic processes. We are more than just animate machines. We're, we, we are, we're people. We have innate value. Our Lord Jesus Christ died for us. And yet, even churches can get sucked in to kind of being focused on the bills and focused on the processes and, and focused on a lot of things, but do they remember the one thing needful? That is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, Jesus is the kind of guy who takes five loaves and two fishes and turns them into food enough to feed thousands with leftovers. How come he can't do it with us? You know? If, if Jesus is truly God, if he is the good teacher, the good teacher, the word that is reserved for God alone, and if he teaches us what it means to love him and love one another, doesn't it mean that he can make the impossible happen? And yet, every time that we try to follow his teaching, we always fall short. That's what we do. We are... Sinner saints. We may be called, gathered, enlightened, and sanctified by the Holy Spirit, but we also listen to the devil, the world, and our sinful flesh. And this tug of war is present in our lives and even in our worship, and will be that case either until we depart this life or the last day. We will always be kind of in this tug of war situation. So when Jesus comes to us 
And like the young man asks, hey, these are the commandments. What do you think? If we're being honest with ourselves, and we're being honest with God, we can only say, we messed up. We fell short of your glory. We broke your commandments. We forgot that you are the good teacher. We forgot that you are our Lord and Savior. We forgot that you died for our sins. And we had our mind on other things. And this happens in all of our lives. All the time. The only thing that this young man forgot to rely on was Christ himself. Because he was offered several opportunities. Number one, when Jesus said, oh, you called me good. No one's good but God. The young man, that was an opportunity to say, yes, but you are God, and you're the one on whom I rely. He got told about the commandments, and he could have said, Lord, I fall short of the commandments. I'm, I'm, I'm a poor, miserable sinner. But I confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you, and in you only do I have my hope. That was Opportunity number two. Number three, do the impossible, fellow. Give away everything you have. Peel away that riches and that false god and throw it on the trash heap. Give it away. Stop your idolatry and start believing. Can't do it, Lord. Can't do it. He had three opportunities to receive the Lord, not as a confident upstanding, rich young man, but as a poor, miserable sinner. He had the opportunity to confess, be forgiven, and be called, gathered, enlightened, and sanctified to Jesus, and he passed. He passed on those opportunities because he loved himself, he loved his riches, he loved his own abilities, the things that would always betray him in the end. He loved those more than Jesus. And he went away sorrowful because he couldn't have his cake and eat it too. He couldn't have his stuff, his possessions, his false God, as well as the true God. No man can serve two masters. Either he will love one or hate the other. And the same is with us too. And every time we, in our own personal lives, or together as a corporate group of people, or as members of society, try to have two masters, what will ultimately happen is things will go south. And uh, in our own lives, you know, when we see all, everything that's going on, we realize that the going south part, a lot of the causes for that have been around for a long time. And what we're seeing now is the fruit. And uh, really, I mean, what scriptures say, that sin starts out kind of small, kind of almost inconsequential. Did God really say don't eat the fruit. But then sin grows up from being small to being big. And when sin is big, it's hard to deal with. Sins in our life are often small. We can handle it. And then they get big. And then they become hard to handle. What are you going to do? How are you going to deal with it? And that's where you go to Jesus. Not confidently saying, I can do it. I'm pretty good. I'm successful. I'm, I, I, I learned what to do in school. I learned how to do things right. I am confident, and I am competent, and I can do this, Lord. Nope. You go to the Lord on your knees, saying, I'm broken. I don't work. I don't function like I should. I am a busted pot. I'm good for nothing. You, you can't use me for what you want to use. Uh, I'm, I'm no good, and you're the only one I have. And that's when, just like Job repented in dust and ashes, God will then turn to you, and he will put you back together again. He will give you more than you originally had. And it won't, because, it won't be because you are so good, or so upstanding, or so confident or competent, but it would be because... You left your idols and your false gods on the trash heap. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, you were called, gathered, enlightened, and sanctified, and gathered to Christ, and renewed, restored, forgiven, and lifted up. 
We can't do it on our own. This nullo modo posset of the small catechism when it refers to the fact that the Holy Spirit is the only one who can call, gather, and light, and sanctify us. This is what we rely on. We will not get there because of our own meritocracy, our own ideas, our own striving. We will get there because we, broken, bruised, beaten sinners, beaten down by this world, nevertheless have seen, beheld our Savior and confessed our sins and received more than we ever asked for. It is on our knees, tearful, that we come to our Lord to receive forgiveness. It is with heavy hearts that we live life knowing that we betray our Lord at times, just like Peter did. And it is with sad, broken, heavy-hearted bodies that we prepare to depart this life. And yet, in all three of those instances, we are confident that our Lord, the good one, the good teacher, God himself, as well as the man Jesus Christ, God and man in one flesh, in one person, this Christ will forgive us. This Christ will restore us. This Christ will give us eternal life. Not because of anything that we had in our reason or strength, but because... He chose to be merciful to us, poor, miserable sinners, and it's on that basis alone that we can stand joyfully before his eternal throne. And may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the one true faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all according to their needs. We ask that you lend divine healing for all of those who are in need of it. We ask that you bless all who are waiting on medical procedures. We ask that you comfort all who are struggling with cancer and give them hope and healing. We ask that you be with all who are struggling to recover from COVID. We ask that you are with all of those who are in care facilities. We ask all that you comfort all who are dealing with chronic pain. And we ask that uh, for all who are in need of you for various reasons, pain, uh, personal, whatever, that you relieve them of this trial if it be your will, and otherwise be their, their constant companion in life and uh, help strengthen them when they have no hope because uh, your strength is made perfect in weakness, and we know that we can always turn to you, and we will receive forgiveness, even we who are weak and weary and heavy laden. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We ask that you be with all those who are in need of divine guidance, protection, especially those whose personal lives have become very complex right now. We ask that you be with our military, first responders, their medical caregivers, and their families, all of those in authority, all who are decision makers, all who need to know right from wrong and to discern the good from the evil. And we ask that your Holy Spirit come to them and call, gather, enlighten, and sanctify their decisions, even as you would call them to yourself. And Lord, we ask you to be with all uh, who are trying to make good decisions in these unpredictable times, and help us hear ever the voice of our good teacher, our good shepherd, Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. For these and all others for whom we pray, Lord, we set them before your throne of grace, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. At this time, we... Continue with the service of the sacrament on page 208. Please rise. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is to be truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord. Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, for the 
Countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, name and evermore praising you and saying...
refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee. 